yeah okay so hello everybody this is dr abhijit dandekar i am sorry i am not able to participate in this wonderful seminar on uh, maharashtra's cultural heritage its uh, retrospection and roadmap of archaeology and museum in future organized by the sukhaja soma institute of dharma studies owing to some uh, official administrative duties here at the ticket college nevertheless i would be there in spirit but just to have my participation uh, noted i thought i would record my uh, presentation and send it to you so that at least you would be able to uh, listen to what i have to say about the historical archaeology of maharashtra so it's going to be a very small short uh, presentation i'm not going to get into the details of all the excavations and explorations and you know it will be a course in itself of 3 to 4 months so it's only a overview and uh, just trying to see the road map ahead so to begin with what is historical archaeology historical archaeology actually differs from prehistoric or protohistoric archaeology as you all may know <clears throat> in prehistoric or protohistoric archaeology you have to depend essentially on the archaeological or geomorphological geological geographical data to discern uh, your hypothesis or to uh, understand the processes that happened in the prehistoric or protohistoric past now when it comes to historical archaeology a very important aspect or a very important element comes into picture and that element is the element of history now you know that uh, Uh, when you start getting the documents or you getting the evidence of writing that is the period when history quote unquote begins now this is a very convenient uh, way of looking at history history is basically all the past that we have but for our convenience we have made this uh, distinction when we talk about history we essentially talk about written documents be it inscribed or be it written what in whatever manner so in the proto historic period what we have here in uh, in india is a script uh, which is yet to be deciphered so with the evidence of script we have we can't put it in the prehistoric period we also cannot put it in the historical period because the script is yet to be deciphered so we conveniently have proto, uh, placed it into a proto historic uh, period now when it comes to the historical period as you all know historical documents become one of the most important set of evidences uh, at the same time complex establishments like organized religions social organizations occupational groups they start appearing in this period and you have enough data coming from the uh, documentary evidence and as a result of that you know the methodology adopted for the interpretation of data becomes more and more complex so let us see what kind of data we have in the historical period the data available is from diverse sources one is religious uh, literature it could be religious uh, literature or secular literature then you have monumental architecture in the form of uh, say caves or temples you have inscriptions you have coins and then of course from the excavated materials you have uh, excavated structural remains material culture that is the antiquities that you have be it toys be it beads be it uh, ornaments and things like that so uh, the sources the literature source literary sources that we have this is essentially for the early historic period that you have uh, religious literature we talk about the puranas the puranas are a set of uh literature that basically give us the genealogy the political genealogy of various dynasties say for example let us talk about the satvahanas that are mentioned in our puranas now in puranas satvahanas are mentioned as the andras uh, and a total 30 kings are mentioned in various puranas be it matsya puran be it vayu puran be it brahmand puran and so on and so forth five to six puranas talk about the satvahanas similarly other puranas also talk about the uh, the satvahanas and their contemporaries then you have the buddhist and the jaina text we also talk about the region the philosophy uh, the culture and so on and so forth then you have secular literature such as gaha satya sai 
Gaha Saktasai is a kind of anthological work undertaken by one of the kings of the Satwana dynasty, the Hala Satwahan. It is supposed to be an anthology of the Gathas or the poetry written in the Maharashtra Prakrit. And uh, our gentleman, Mr. Khal Satwan, is supposed to have collected this information, collected these poems, and made it into uh, an excellent text called Gaha Saktasai, which gives a lot of information about the cultural lives of people in Maharashtra. Then you have uh, travelogues, you have the Periplus of Erythrean Sea written by an unknown sailor, you have Geography of Ptolemy, you have Setubandha by Prabhupada the second. Uh, Avakatak king. Then later on, you also have travelogues coming in the early medieval period, such as, uh, say, uh, Ibn Hawkal, uh, Al Masudi, uh, Afanasi Nikitin, and so on and so forth. Then, of course, in the medieval period, you have official documents, the letters, the correspondence of various kings and dynasties. So, all this gives us the sources, uh, all this material is basically forms the background uh, of the historical archaeology. Then, of course, you have monumental architecture, you have cave temples, Buddhist cave temples, you have Hindu cave temples or Brahmanical cave temples, to be more precise. You also have uh, the structural temples, structural monasteries, uh, you have palaces, you have forts. All sorts of different uh, architectural evidences are available for you in this period. Then you have inscriptions, you have donatory inscriptions. These are inscriptions like somebody gives some donation, uh, say, to a temple establishment or to a matha establishment, or some king comes and gives donation to establish a mosque. For example, in Goa, you have an inscription of Jayakeshin, the Kadamba king who gave land to build a mosque in 11th century. You have, uh, you know, uh, these are inscriptions which are also royal, that means royal donations. Uh, they also talk about various activities that they undertook and talking about the uh, bravery, valor, and achievements, exploits of these kings. These are known as the eulogistic inscriptions. And they have also given various donations on the occasions of various religious ceremonies and religious events. For example, only the last week we had a very uh, important religious uh, event in, uh, in the uh, Brahmanical fold. That is, uh, which is known as the Devashayani Ekadashi, or in Maharashtra it is known as the Ashadi Ekadashi, where the Vaishnavas believe that their Lord, Lord Vishnu, gets into the cosmic sleep for four months and he will wake up uh, on the Kartik Ekadashi, which is known as Prabodhini Ekadashi. So these two days mark a very important event in the lives of the Vaishnavas and the kings who followed Vaishnavism. Uh, appear to have given many donations in this uh, on these two days. Also, the donation, uh, the events such as lunar eclipses, solar eclipses, also mark uh, important events. And uh, during those days, uh, you see that many kings and queens have given donations to uh, either to an individual Brahmin or group of Brahmins or temple establishments and so on and so forth. So these are known as copper plate inscriptions. In the case of early historic period, you see donations being given by individuals and by kings or royal families to the Buddhist establishments. This is also peri uh, the period where you see uh, coins start coming up, right? From 5th, 6th century C BC onwards, that is the pre maurya period onwards or the Buddha's, uh, Buddha period onwards, you start getting coins in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, we have examples of coins of this period coming from the Vidarbha region, the Maratwada region, uh, and also some parts of Western Maharashtra, which have yielded coins belonging to the Panchmak uh, type. Later on, in the post Mauryan period, also we have coins which could be, which are uh, sometimes unscribed without any legend, or there are some coins which are also inscribed telling us the names of the issuers or telling the name of the city from where they were issued. So all these sources form another uh, backbone of historical archaeology. And the main thrust comes from the excavations and explorations. 
uh, I'm going to concentrate my talk essentially on the excavations and explorations. Uh, now, this why these excavations and explorations are important because the material yielded to these excavations as well as explorations uh, gives us uh, a lot of information about the cultural lives of these people. Uh, they tell us about the structural uh, remains, and then through structural remains, we can uh, talk about the their architecture, the technology prevalent in those periods. Uh, the kind of material used for uh, building structures such as bricks, mortar, uh, stone structures, and so on and so forth. You also get a lot of pottery of this period, which is very unique in, in a sense that the pottery tells you about the source, uh, the source material. It talks about the contacts, the provenance, uh, trade, and things like that. Then small antiquities like uh, ornaments or uh, beads, uh, toys, some small uh, idols uh, will tell you more about the cultural life of this period. Uh, the floral remains, the botanical remains, and the faunal remains or the animal remains talk about their food habits uh, and things like that. So I'm going to essentially talk about these excavations and explorations, mostly about excavations. Now, some of the important excavations that were carried out in Maharashtra so far uh, are Karad in Satara district. This is the earliest site which was excavated by the Bharat Itya Sanshodan Mandal of uh, Pune by Dr. G. H. Khare, followed by Brahmapuri excavations by the Deccan College, Dr. H. T. Sankalia. Uh, so far, I was excavated much before Karad also. This was basically to uh, excavate the stupa and another uh, reliquaries of from the stupa. The Nastic excavations, Nevasa excavations carried out by the Deccan College, Prakashi excavations, Bahal excavations carried out by the Archaeological Survey of India. Uh, these are in the Khandesh region of Maharashtra, Bokardan, in the Jalna district today in Maratpada, Paitan, uh, a very famous site of the Satvahan period and also of the uh, medieval period. Ter, the famous city of Tagar. Uh, Kandhar, uh, one of the capitals of the Rashtrakutas. Shiur happens to be another site just on the border of uh, Vidarbha region, the Yavatmal district and Marathwada region, the Nandit district. Wakao in Solapur district, Mudbi in Solapur district. Siddhapur is another site which is not mentioned over here. Adam, Bhon, Arani, Mahur Jari, Kahale, Brahmapuri, Kolapur, Kaundinyapur, Paunar, Mansar, Nagardhan. All these sites in the Vidarbha region, various uh, districts of uh, Vidarbha, uh, giving us evidence of the early historic period, period of the Satvahanas and period of the Vakatakas uh, over there. Then sites like Mandad uh, in the Raigad district, Junnar in Pune district, Shaul again in Raigad district, Pauni again in Vidarbha. These are some of the important sites. And they have given ample evidence of the early historic period. I'm stressing more on the early historic period over here. And I'll tell you the reasons why. So let us see what we get. Now, this is the map which generally gives you idea that you see that almost in almost all the districts, you have uh, excavations. Barring, of course, some say Sangli, we don't have much excavation. In Bid, we don't have excavation. Uh, in Dhule, we don't have excavation. Uh, of course, Dhule, of course, we have Prakashi over here. So you see, many rivers have been targeted. Rivers and their tributaries have been targeted by the explorers, by the archaeologists to find the sites. And of course, sites coming from uh, you know, uh, the copper plates and other uh, documentary evidence sites like Kandahar, which was known for the Rashtrakuta period. The site was excavated by uh, Dr. M. K. Dhavlikar and Dr. A. P. Zabkhedkar of the Smara State Directorate of Archaeology and uh, Museums. Uh, sites in Vidarbha include Mansar, Nagardhan is another site uh, near Nagpur, then Adam, Pauni, uh, uh, Paunar in Vadha district over here, Pauni in uh, the eastern Vidarbha region. So all these sites have given evidence of a very interesting time. So the early historic period in Maharashtra kind of begins from third begins from third century BC. Now why I'm saying that the earliest evidence, though I told you just now that there are found uh, in the Vidarbha region and in the Maratwada region, 
uh, they are known as the points of the Vidarbha Janapada and Ashmaka Janapada. Uh, probably this uh, coins are part of surface findings. We do not have any uh, evidence coming from a stratified uh, context. Now, what I mean by stratified context is uh, once we excavate the site, uh, we know that the mounds are made of various layers of uh, soil. So all these various layers, known as the strata, uh, give us a kind of context that at which depth we, we have found these coins, what associated material we have found these coins. So can we date these coins based on the associated material? If you find any kind of carbon over there, if we can date that carbon and we can get date for the coins and things like that. Sadly, we don't have evidence coming from the excavations of these punch, early punchmark coins. So these are mostly stray finds and mostly surface finds. Uh, so the earliest historical evidence that we have is are the two uh, inscriptions of uh, the Emperor Ashoka. The Emperor Ashoka, as we all know, ruled the Indian subcontinent in third century BCE, and he has his uh, exhortations uh, known as Ashokan Edicts written on pillars or written on rock surfaces. So we have his two major rock edicts, rock edicts number eight and nine, which were found at Sopara and now they are housed in the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj <coughs> Vastu Sangrahale, earlier known as the Prince of Wales Museum in, uh, in Mumbai. So from Ashoka onwards, we have evidence of uh, the historical period. So that is why I say that historical period starts in Maharashtra by around 3rd century BC. There could be earlier settlements. Now, when we talk about the future prospects, this is one of the prospects that we need to look into that after the uh, disappearance of the Bronze Age cultures like the Malwa cultures, uh, the late Jorve cultures, way uh, around uh, say 8900 BCE. And then in the Vidarbha, you have the megalithic culture, which gets kind of transformed into the early historic period also. But in this part of the Maharashtra, that is the Western Maharashtra region, we are yet to find the period of transition from say 8th century BCE or 9th century BCE to 3rd century BCE. We do not know what happened in this period. So this is a definitely a problem that needs to be tackled. Now, you see that through, uh, though the Satavanas emerged as the first imperial dynasty, there are many other families such as the Maharathis, the Chutus, the Sebakas, the Mahabhojas ruling in different parts of Maharashtra. For example, the Nanegat inscription uh, of Naganika talks about Maharathis. You have inscriptions coming from the Kuda caves that in the Raikad district, which talk about the Mahabhojas. The Gandharpale caves talk about another family called the Kanabhojas. Uh, you have coins of the Chutus and Sebakas found, uh, Sebakas found in Vidarbha region, Chutus found in, in the Kolhapur region. Uh, so all these different dynasties were ruling in Maharashtra uh, who were contemporary to the uh, Satvanas. And of course, there was this rival dynasty of the Kshaharathas. Now, this information essentially comes from the inscriptional and numismatic evidences, as I told you earlier. Now, I told you about the city uh, set, set coins. This is the coin of Bhadravati. Uh, you can see written in Brahmi, Bhadravatiya. You can also see the symbols over here, the elephant with raised trunk and tree in railing. Uh, these symbols were subsequently used by the Satavahanas. You have the coins of this, uh, the, uh, the Chutuku uh, Kulananda uh, coins. Uh, no, so this is the Kurasa uh, coins, the uh, Rayo Vasiti Purata, Putasa Kurasa. Kura was an dynasty which was in the Western Maharashtra, the Kolhapur region. This is the coin of Mulananda, uh, the dynasty which is known as the Ananda dynasty the, or the Chutu dynasty. These coins are there. Then you have the coins of local Kshatrapa rulers. This is the coin of Maharathi uh, Isa Mula, uh, who was a Kshatrapa. These are the coins of various uh, Maharathis uh, found in the Karad region. So all these are different coins. Now let us come to the excavated remains. Uh, 
overall if we see we see these excavations now remember one thing the mounds that are there at nevasa at adam at pawnee are huge at ter are huge mounds now we do not have so much resources number one to excavate the end, the mounds in their entirety secondly archaeologically it is not ethical to excavate the entire mound because you know these mounds were excavated sometimes in 50s and 60s and 70s now we have a lot of technology available at our hands now if you want to do uh, say ground penetrating radar survey in this uh, on these sites and imagine if the sites were not available and were excavated by the earlier scholar then we would have lost the entire data and thanks to the uh, vision of these early scholars that we have sites for further uh, research and further excavations so the sites uh, like adam pawnee brahmapuri ter bhon bhukardan have given evidences of large scale activities of architecture constructions both uh, household construction that is residential construction and probably sometimes commercial also we also see public works such as the ring wells the brick wells the water supply systems and things like that we also see fortification walls around the sites sites such as chaul and mandar on the coast have given evidences of long distance trade in the form of uh, say torpedo jars or the amphorae which were used as container jars for long distance trade now you can see these are two sites uh, both from vidarbha region and a view to say for example the sites of pawni you see a fortification around the site you at adam also you see uh, a fortification over here now this is the modern day picture of adam this is what has happened to the moat and then this is the habitation mound on this in this region so yeah, at adam now this is from uh, brahmapuri excavations to kolhapur you see the water lines over here the wells over here huge houses over here now all these are public works departments whether the brick wells or uh, the terracotta ring wells you see this these are from uh collaborative excavations these are the ring wells and the brick wells one found at bone uh and i think this is from prakash uh, excavations as you can see these are essentially uh public works uh, structures in the sense that these were not made by an individual these were made by some uh, administrative authority like a municipality or a gram panchayat these are basically sewage canals and all your waste water all even solids were drained out through this there are some more uh, evidences and most of the sites have yielded this this was a regular phenomenon you can also see terracotta pipes over here so all these structures all these constructions point towards a kind of organized urban settlements these are not self sufficient rural settlements living by themselves no there was a kind of central authority there was some kind of governing body or administrative body which took care of such public works now this is a very interesting uh, structure this is the water management system found at bone uh, this is kind of irrigation kind of uh, having siphon columns over here so that the pressure is created on water and then this water is uh, carried from one uh, place to another you can see over here these are the uh, evidences of this uh, water management body you can see uh, the river uh, over over here and from here the water is carried towards the settlement now this this what you see they they essentially create pressure and create water columns so that water column creates pressure by its own and then it helps the water to move ahead uh these excavations as i told you you also have a uh, presence of religious architecture sites such as ter bhon and pawnee have given evidences of the buddhist stupas uh the stupas intel tell us that Uh, buddhism was very was very dominant in the early historic period in maharashtra uh the caves at say ajanta caves are very famous of course but then other caves at bhacha karla betsa junnar uh, gandharpale kuda mandar everywhere you see this buddhist establishments uh, coming up in this period the early historic period 
and a lot of donations are given to these uh, buddhist establishments you have structural stupas at their bone and things like that and probably this also tells us that there was a presence of religious economy as we have today uh, in this region the region of maharashtra this various donative inscriptions or donatory inscriptions reinforce this fact that many people probably came and visited this regularly and uh, Uh, economy and economy uh, kind of formed around these places which gave further impetus to the process of urbanization in the later period you see by around 4th 5th century ce onwards the brahmanical caves do humbly start coming up you have caves near shur uh, caves near uh, lanje the caves of kataraga uh, zaude in the ratnagiri district very humble uh, beginnings of the brahmanical caves slowly they get in more into prominence and you have caves at uh, uh, in mandapeshwar caves in mumbai or the famous elephanta caves near mumbai uh, the elora caves uh, near aurangabad and so on and so forth so uh, this religious uh, economy probably kind of thrived in this period and was very helpful uh, in the entire process of urbanization so what it tells us is basically the earlier evidence or earlier hypothesis rather of deurbanization uh, that took place in indian subcontinent that is one of the theories put forth by professor r s sharma uh, is kind of being negated by the evidence that we are getting now i'll talk more on that later on so this is the evidence of religious architecture uh, you can see the stupa over here and the stupa and bone over uh, here you see this religious symbols over here so all these evidences tell us about a very strong presence of organized religion these are various brick sizes you can see the alloy circuit they range from 70 cm to 50 cm to 35 cm and so on and so forth they were in thickness they are around 15 to 20 sometimes 25 cm and uh, uh, in width they are around 15 to 20 cm and in length in breadth they are around or in thickness they are around 7 to 10 cm these are typical early historic roof tiles so probably these perforations were made to attach one roof tile to tie one roof tile to another and then we come to the ceramic assemblage the ceramic assemblage you uh, includes the red slip ware the coarse red ware black and red ware red polished ware burnished black ware and then of course amphorae and megarian ware uh, this is a typical red polished ware jar Uh, that you have many times you must have seen in uh, various icons of various deities say for example uh, icons of brahma for example you see similar kind of picture being held by brahma so this is one of the earliest forms of kamandalu that you have so these are all red slip wear black and red wear uh, shirts coming from junnar this is black and red wear this is your red slip wear all this is early historic pottery this is coarse red wear so pottery with shine pottery with normal coarse uh, for daily uses uh, specialized pottery with <clears throat> black inside and red outside so all this various uh, black pottery all this various combinations can be seen and in addition you have this pottery known as amphorae coming from the coastal sites and of course the sites like nevasa and ter have also yielded uh, amphorae now what are amphorae amphorae are specialized container vessels they are also transport vessels they were brought from the roman empire various areas of roman empire need not be directly from rome but from say uh, other regions of europe other regions of middle east some parts of africa and so on and so forth and they contained either olive oil or fish sauce or wines which were kind of offloaded offloaded in uh, on the coast and taken to the hinterland and 
Sometimes you also have evidences of this amphora being refilled after you pour out the material. Uh, you refill them with spices. Such one such amphora was found at Berenike in Egypt uh, along the Red Sea coast, uh, where they found the amphora, one amphora full of long paper. Of course, this amphora must have come from the Kerala coast. But similarly, goods must have been going from Maharashtra also because. The Periplus of Erythrean Sea tells us that the, the cities of Python and Ter were very important for their cloth, especially Ter was known for its muslin cloth, which was transported to the Roman region. This is a molded pot, Megarian ware coming from uh, the Roman world. So all the evidence of this pottery of foreign origin tells you about the long distance contact that Maharashtra had during the early historic period. Now other finds include art objects, these objects reveal the aesthetics as well as the technology of the period, we'll come to that. Uh, not, not, not only the art objects, but also the tools and weapons, say a sword or a sickle or a simple nail. Uh, will tell you about the iron technology, the kind of forging that we had, the kind of smelting technology we had, uh, the ancient Maharashtrians had, and so on and so forth. Uh, that also tells you about the source of ore, ore or the source of raw material used. Uh, one thing you need to understand, the fact that they were able to uh, use iron tells us that uh, they were very advanced in technology. Iron requires a very high temperature around 1600 degrees and a very controlled environment for its smelting. So the fact that the iron smelting was known to the early historic people tells you that, okay, these people were technologically quite advanced. Uh, the Tigaratra figurines, which we'll, we shall see, uh, for example, these are very small ornaments made of terracotta found at the site of uh, bone. These are pendants. Now see, these are pendants at the same time, they also tell you that these are Buddhist symbols. So this Sriratna symbol or Nandipada symbol used as pendant tells you about the religious affiliation of the people who used it and you made this. Along with that, you have beautiful small fish over here. These are semi-precious stones beads and paintings. These are glass beads. You can see the variety of beads. These are found in the excavations at Junnar. Collared beads, gatrun beads, segmented beads coming from probably the later period, again okay, made of glass. So this tells you that what kind of aesthetics these people had. These are terracotta beads known as uh, the areca nut beads and small bangles that you can see over here. They look like the areca nut uh, that we have. So these are known as areca nut beads. These are ivory bang uh, conch bangles. These are uh, glass bangles. So you see a very rich cultural material. Now you'll ask me why we don't have gold over here. Remember one thing, gold is such a precious uh, metal or material that it is often recycled. Gold and silver are not very uh, frequently found. We do find gold beads and silver beads, things like that, but they are very rare. Now, this is a very interesting uh, object. This is a rubber stone. This is uh, a skin rubber. This is made of terracotta. Now, this is a typical early historic uh, Antiquity. This is a dice. The dice probably was used for playing Chaucer, playing uh, for gambling. You know the famous story of Mahabharat. The similar uh, dice is very used. This is a uh, this is an ivory handle. Now this ivory handle uh, is from uh, Pompeii. Uh, in Rome, an identical one was found at Ter, which is there in the Ter Museum. So we know that ivory, the Indian uh, artists were very 
famous for carving ivory and it was paint as an object of art to uh, room these are some of the satvahana terracottas you can see over here now they were made using a double mold uh, technique so this is the mold that was found in one of the excavations this is a statue of poseidon found uh, in kolhapur so similar such objects of roman origin were also uh, found at kolhapur these are roman lamps found at ter uh coins as i told you you have coins uh, major source of information so you have this satvahan coins this is from the nevasa pathan region the typical coin now remember the coin of bhadravati that you saw uh which had elephant with raised trunk and tree in the so similar symbols were used by the satvahanas these are coins of the satvahanas you see gajalakshmi a very famous or popular uh, symbol of prosperity used these are mostly found in the buddhist caves also and also on the coins of the satvahanas now this is a very interesting coin this coin shows a ship with double mast this signifies uh, the long distance trade Uh, that was there during the time of satvana now this coin belongs to one of the satvana ruler yajneshri satakarni so this probably <coughs> this coin was probably uh, <coughs> minted to commemorate uh, the long distance trade with the rome so this also tells you that how this trade was important for the satvanas for the ruling dynasties then and then you have coins of the satvanas and coin of the rivals the western chatrapas or the kshatras the famous king of nahapan called nahapan who were who were who was an arch rival of uh, the satvanas then these are the coins of the satvanas coins of vasishtaputra satakarni vasishtaputra pulumavi the coins of the kshaharatas the uh, nahapanas the predecessors coins of uh, agudaka and you have the coin of uh, nahapan over here with his face on one side and his symbol dynastic symbol on the other and here you have coin of nahapan which was counter struck by his arch rival gautami putra satakarni now gautami putra satakarni definitely defeated sat nahapan which is corroborated by uh, the evidence coming from coins and also from inscription in his nasik cave number 3 inscription his son gautami putra son vasishta putra polmavi tells us about Uh, the victory over nahapan this is coin of chastana uh, nahapana not successor but the dynasty changed the kardamaka dynasty which started ruling maharashtra after the satvanas and these are the coins of the kardamaka ruler and now we come to the late historical and medieval archaeology now late historical or medieval archaeology still is an in an incipient stage in maharashtra Oh, uh, well, I can also say that it is in the incipient state in India even today, because most of the scholars so far concentrated mostly on the proto-historic or the prehistoric period, and if not so, then on the uh, early historic period. Again, because you know the history, quote unquote, again dominates in the late historical and medieval period. So most of the scholars. concentrated on the documentary evidence or literary evidence to understand the late historical period uh, very few efforts have been made so far to understand the late historical and medieval period from the archaeological point of view as well as i would say that we know the entire genealogies of these kings so be it the rashtrakutas or the gurudara pratiharas or talk about the shilaharas uh we know all the genealogies we know that there were three branches of the shilaharas the one ruled from north kokan south kokan from kolhapur region from karad region so on and so forth but we do not know about anything about the town planning we have evidences of town planning coming from their copper plates we know that their capital was shri sthanak of modern day thana near mumbai north of mumbai but we do not know how their houses were made 
we do not know how uh, their pottery is were made very little is known for about this period same is the case with the medieval period if i talk about the nizami nizam shahs and uh, the adil shahs or the bahmanis or the marathas we all know about their forts we all know about uh, you know their uh, wars their battles and the region that they ruled all through their documents and the forts that are standing today but hardly any settlement is found on the forts uh, hardly any excavations have been carried out on the forts so we do not know uh, what kind of utensils the medieval people used uh, what kind of structures they had what kind of settlement pattern they had and remember one thing as and how the society starts becoming more and more complex with many factors coming in not only the economic or political but also the social factors coming in the caste system becoming more and more rigid it all has an impact and effect on the settlement pattern but we hardly know anything about this period as regards the uh, things are concerned so all this is reflected in the uh, you know uh, the lack of data that we have of this period uh, what kind of information that we have say for example since the copper plates talk about sanjan now sanjan is a site which was excavated by world zarathustra cultural foundation the director of excavation was dr kurush dalal i was part of the team and we found a very thriving urban settlement over there uh, which is kind of corroborated by one of the copper plates that found in chinsli which talk about a very thriving cosmopolitan metropolis and the governor of that metropolis was uh, a tajik governor called madhumati which is a sanskritized name of muhammad so all these things again uh, a travelog by al masudi talk about chaul in a similar fashion it tells us now this again is of 9th century the copper plates again are of 9th century they tell us that chaul uh, the chaul was a cosmopolitan center with people from various faiths and beliefs lived happily together uh the all this coming from the inscriptional evidence or from the literary uh, evidence now when we excavated chaul again by the deccan college and mandad uh, kind of jointly by india study center and uh, deccan college so you found evidence of long distance trade long distance trade with africa now the long distance trade with rome was an uh, expired chapter but trade with africa with middle east with southeast asia uh, was still on so for example you have this amphorae uh, apart from amphorae as i told you earlier we also have uh, later forms of this amphora known as the torpedo jars which start coming up in around 7th century onwards you have pottery from west asia pottery called as the turquoise glazed ware uh, here and uh, the hatched scraffiato ware both these pottery is coming from uh, iran modern day iran we also have apart from this two we also have pottery coming from iraq with the baghdad basra region the tin glazed ware and so on and so forth so all this tells you now this pottery is from china not all of them could be from china now this is what i mean i said that hardly anything is known about this period in the sense that we know that this pottery appears to be of the ming period and it looks like the ming pottery but its chemical analysis will tell us whether this is coming from china or this is an uh, imitated pottery coming from west asia remember one thing that west asia also imitated pottery or this pottery is coming from southeast asia say from thailand or from korea or from other places in southeast or east asia this needs to be proved now we don't have enough material to tell you about this at this juncture very little is worked on on this pottery so we just have this blue on white porcelain known as ming uh, pottery or stoneware or celadon ware we do not know uh, so i was talking about uh, the long distance trade we have this small micro bits coming from ex chaul excavations uh, the chemical analysis of the trace element analysis of this uh, beads tell us that uh, this beads uh, 
were found at Shaul and they were also found at a Kenyan site of M. Twapa. So the beads from M. Twapa were essentially chemically analyzed along with the beads from Chaul. And we found that the beads from Chaul were exported to M. Twapa, a site in Kenya. So not only in West Asia or in Southeast Asia, we also have connections. We also had connections in uh, Africa in this period. So all this period, the medieval period, uh, needs to be further probed uh, in this connection. So to summarize, we can say that the historical period in Maharashtra was a very hectic period. Uh, it was the period that witnessed emergence and decline of cities, emergence of new urban centers, uh, these are political urban centers or religious or uh, and economic. This emergence was the result of very many factors such as trade, religion, political stability, which were of uh, which of course were uh, interdependent. After the end of the early historic phase, by around 5th century CE, during the time of the Vakatakas, we need uh, more uh, archaeological data to understand the changing nature of the society. As I told you, the society is becoming more and more complex. We have more and more information uh, coming from various sources. So that needs to be gleaned, that needs to be understood in the archaeological context. So a holistic approach, which includes studies in epigraphy, numismatics. Now you remember one thing that numismatics again needs to be understood in the earliest, uh, late historical and early medieval context. Not coins of the Rashtrakutas, the coins of the Shilaras are now coming up. They are beginning to surface now. So the earlier notion that they didn't have any coinage in the early medieval period or the late historical period uh, is again now not accepted by the scholars. So we need to work on the coins of the Vakatakas, which are found in the excavations at Nakardhan, the coins of the Rashtrakutas found in the excavations at Sanjan, uh, coins of the Chalukyas, coins of the Shilaras need to be understood. So uh, the numismatic evidence, the art and architecture evidence, along with archaeological explorations and excavations, assisted by studies in texts and documents, will be helpful in understanding the character of this region and to understand the archaeology of this region in the historical period. This will basically tell us about how this character called Naharasha was built through ages, what kind of uh, challenges it survived, what kind of challenges it overcame, and why we are today the way we are. Thank you.